everyone, and welcome back to the Deeply Rooted podcast by Planting Roots, where we encourage Christian military women and wives to stand strong in the faith during the trials of military life. I'm Liz. And I'm Erin. And today we're just going to give a little life update and then dive into what the Lord has been teaching us this week. Yeah, so Liz, do you want to kick us off? How's your week been? I know that you got uh, some MRI news yesterday. (laughs) Yeah, so... If you know me, you know I love to run, and I've had nagging hip pain for the past two years, and no doctor has really taken it seriously. They've just referred me to PT. They've never referred me to a specialist or referred me to get an MRI, even though I asked. And I finally convinced a doctor here once I moved to let me get an MRI because I, I know something is wrong, and I got the MRI results back yesterday and I don't know the extent of how badly but I know my labrum is torn which is what I thought was wrong and labral tears can be common but I was immediately referred out to ortho after my results came back and I I don't know how bad they are so I really can't say until I get an answer from ortho if I'm going to need surgery or not or I'm going through PT again to see if that that changes things but yeah that was I'm feeling a lot better than yesterday yesterday was kind of a mess because I was also dealing with this nagging tooth pain from, I got a cavity filled a week ago, and I've had, like, the worst toothache for, like, three days. But this morning I woke up, and I don't – it's gone. So I prayed to the Lord for healing yesterday, and I'm like, Lord, I pray it doesn't come back. Because I was going to go to the dentist today to get that figured out. So it was that throbbing pain that was driving me crazy on top of hearing that I, like, potentially need surgery. It was not a good day, but I'm feeling much better today. I prayed about it. My friend prayed over me. I am feeling better. But one – one thing that has come out of this is I was supposed to run the Indianapolis Marathon in like a few weeks and obviously I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm not, I haven't been training because I've been injured and I think God is using this trial in my life to remove that idol from my life because I've always been convicted of spending more time in the gym or running than spending time with God and now that I'm injured that has completely flipped and I spend way more time with God than I do working out and it just reminds me of that verse in 1 Timothy 4 8 where it says, While bodily training is of some value, godliness is of value in every way as it holds promise for the present life and also for the life to come. So working out isn't bad in and of itself, but I was putting it above God and through this he's removed that idol and I'm I'm so thankful for that because he's drawn me so much closer to him in this season. So I've been really trying to focus on the positives and just leaning into the Lord into my relationship with him. And I've been trying not to worry because I feel like this whole week I've been so full of anxiety and I don't have the answers yet. There's no need to worry about having surgery or having a root canal. That was where <laughs> my mind went. That was where my mind went during the two things. Mm-hmm. Because that's not true. I've not been diagnosed. So I'm just trying to focus on what's true. And so I've been meditating before I go to bed on Philippians 4, 8. Finally, which says, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praise work praiseworthy think about such things so I've just been meditating on that because I've had also trouble sleeping because of my tooth pain and just because I'm worrying so Mm -hmm. I'm trying to pray that over me because worry is a sin fear is a sin and I'm just trying to repent of that and run to the Lord and just pray that he would would heal me of that and that I don't need to worry because he's in control of everything and he's sovereign over everything and if anyone else is struggling with any health issues my friend prayed this verse over me and I just felt so comforted by the Lord and so seen by him. But the verse is Psalm 34, 18. The Lord is close to the brokenhearted and saves those who are crushed in spirit. The righteous person may have many troubles, but the Lord delivers him from them all. He protects all his bones. Not one of them will be broken. And I just felt like such peace in my spirit that no matter what happens, like I have the Lord and it's all going to work out. Even if the worst case scenario does happen, I'm going to be okay. And I don't need to worry about that because I don't know if that is what's needed yet to heal my labrum. So yeah, I'm just trying to have faith in the Lord as a great, great physician that he will heal me. And even if he doesn't, my hope is in him alone, but my toothache is gone. So I'm like, Lord, thank you. That was, I I can only deal with one thing at a time. So yeah, but the Lord has been with me in this season and I definitely deepen my relationship with him, deepen my trust in him, deepen my faith with him. And so I'm just trying to trust in him for that. And then Friday also, I have my board for work, which if you're in the military, you know, it's like a qualification board where they basically like bombard you with questions for five hours. And my mind just like cannot, I can't even think about that right now. Cause I'm like focused on this, but I need to study today. So, uh, that's another thing that I'm, I'm, 
I'm trying to get through. So trying to get through that all while dealing with um, sabbatical stuff, but it's been good. The Lord is teaching me a lot in this season and teaching me to surrender and to sacrifice. Because I know that you've been a runner as long as I've known you and in high school and everything, but you should just give a little bit of background about like where that love came from. Yes. So I started running when I became a Christian, basically. Um, So that's why it's like so near and dear to my heart. Like I would talk with God on those runs when I like first started talking to God and I would listen to Christian music and run because I went to a Christian concert and I that's like kind of where I like saw the Lord work in my heart and after that Christian concert I just started running like my friends did long running running the Christian friends that I had met they were on the cross country team so that is like where my love for running started and then ever since then I've, I've been a runner I've ran two marathons I ran a few half marathons I did track in high school, but I really just got into like the meditative state of long distance running and not like competing and just doing different races. And my husband's a huge runner. So that's something that we also love to do together. Like on the weekends, we love going for a long run together. It's like a great way for us to spend quality time. So now I've replaced those for walking. I have still been running, but now officially like I'm not. I've been trying to run before I got the results back. I would like run once a week and be in pain. And I was like, well, try it again next week. But now I'm like officially done and it is like a hard thing to process, but I'm trying to use this time to get closer to the Lord. And I don't know how long I'm going to be out of running. I know until like I can run without pain. Yeah, I knew I knew that you had like always been a runner. And I also knew that like your closest friends from back home were your cross country friends. Um, But I didn't know exactly that that's like tied to when you became a Christian. So it's cool. And I also it's something that I've admired about you, just your consistency with fitness because that's where I've struggled like I feel like some some months some years even I'm like on a high and like want to work out and need that for my mental space and then sometimes I convince myself that I like I'm too busy or whatever and I think postpartum the consistency is what I've really been working on because your goals just change after you have a baby I mean your body's different and everything um but I've been trying to get back into it too but I've admired your consistency um just over time as I've known you so just wanted to point that out (laughs) but I know that that's probably a struggle now that you can't do that and that you're having to find it you know find find time outside of running to get in that same meditative state you know yeah but I am thankful that I can still move my body like in other ways like walking like I can still walk and I can still stationary cycle I don't know if that's gonna I'm not gonna be able to do that but that doesn't cause me pain so I I do that it's definitely not running but I'm I'm trying to find other ways but how was your week been oh this week I thought it was gonna be like a catch-up calm after like a lot of busyness kind of week and then last minute we had like a admiral visit thrown into the mix and unfortunately admirals can't just like pop in and say hi admirals have to have like you know a ton of briefing and prep documents and like you know specific schedules and all the stuff and I got assigned as like the project officer for the visit and so it's been really busy and I didn't expect it to be busy. Uh, and then this morning I woke up in my voice. I don't know if you can hear it's like, you know, rascally this morning. And so I'm drinking tea. I never drink tea. I'm usually a coffee, coffee drinker, but tea sounded much better for my throat this morning. But so yeah, I've been a busy week. I've definitely had some reflections with it. Just like, I don't know. I think in the past when spontaneous things were thrown in my lap, it would really stress me out. And I don't know, my spirit was bothered by it. This go around, it's been cool because it hasn't necessarily been like that. I still feel the stress of like needing to get everything done in the time crunch aspect, but I don't feel thrown off balance, if you know what I mean. Like I don't, it's not affecting my entire life. And I think why that is, is because I've taken, I've taken me out of it. Like I, when you're trying to accomplish a task, and also trying to look good accomplishing a task, that's when I feel like stress comes. Um, But when you're just trying to accomplish the task, it's like, okay, like, I can get this done. Yes, it's a time crunch, but like, I can do it. And so I don't know, it's just been a cool reflection that I've, you know, grown in where my identity is, and how it isn't so much in work anymore. Uh, So that's been a cool, cool thing. But Liz, you want to jump into what you've been learning in the Word this week? Yes. Um, And I also just wanted to say, I feel that with work, it's so freeing to have your identity in the Lord and not in what you're doing. And yes, it's important to work heartily until the Lord, but not having your identity in it can free you up. And that's how I feel about my board. I'm like, yes, I want to do well, but like my identity is not in 
in my work. And so I like what you said about that. But yes, I'll get into what the Lord has been teaching me this week. I'm going to go to Matthew 19 because I read that passage this week and it was just showed me a lot about sacrifice, which I'm learning a lot in my life, laying things down for the Lord and um, just being being obedient to his calling. And I was reading about the rich young man and he says, teacher, what good must I do to have eternal life? And the Lord tells him he needs to follow his commandments. And the rich young man says, all of these I've kept, what still do I lack? And Jesus said to him, if you would be perfect, go sell what you possess and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven and come and follow me. When the young man heard this, he went away sorrowful for he had great possessions. So the young man was not willing to give away all his material possessions for the Lord. And I think that this passage shows us that true discipleship often requires sacrifice and a willingness to prioritize our spiritual wealth over material gain. And I was just reading this and thinking, like, what do I need to give away to follow Jesus? And this concept kind of mimics Matthew 16, 24, which is a few chapters back where Jesus says, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. So in thinking through, like, what I need to lay down at the Lord's feet, obviously one is surrendering, working out to him and giving that to him and just trusting that he is going to provide. And also, I've just felt the call to, like, lay down my career at his feet. Like, I don't know where I'm going to be at in 10 years, but I know I want to put my family above my career. And I'm not like completely sure what that looks like. But this passage just like gave me, gave me peace that the Lord sees that sacrifice. And it's important to prioritize him over material gain. Discipleship with the Lord is important. And discipling my family is important over any material gain that I can gain in this world. And the world will tell you, you need you need money, you need success, but that's not the case if you have Jesus. Like trusting in his provision is all that you need. And so I'm really trying to lean into that. And so this passage really spoke to that. And then a few verses down, it also talks more about sacrifice, which I think I res have always resonated with this passage being in the military and as a military spouse. So I just wanted to like share it because it says, if everyone who has left houses or brothers or sisters or father or mother or children or lands for my name's sake, or receive hundredfold and will inherit eternal life. And as military women, we know all too well the sacrifices that come with our service or with our spouse's service. Their, their deployments and PCS moves and the challenge of being away from your family. It's so hard. But the Lord sees that sacrifice. And so I'm just trying to lean into this because sometimes I can get so frustrated with the military. You want to like throw it in the towel. Like I'm sick of mooting. I want to be able to just settle down and be close to my family and my friends. <laughs> And it could be so hard. Like whenever I would go home, whenever I'd be at the airport, I would just feel like this heaviness and this sadness of like, I have to leave. And in this passage just speaks to that sacrifice. And that's, that's why I like it because the Lord has called me and Aaron into the military and as a military spouse. And we just have to remember that leaving behind our family and our friends and following the calling that God has on our life is much better than a plan, walking in a plan that he didn't have for me. And our sacrifices are part of a larger plan for our life that God has. So we may not see it, but he works everything out for the good of those who love him and we can trust him in that. So I just wanted to encourage anyone who has had frustrations with the military or frustrations moving around that this is part of the sacrifice that the Lord has called us to do. And in being obedient to that sacrifice, you're walking in the will of God. And that is so much better than walking in a plan that the Lord didn't have for you. Yeah, my my aunt is a missionary, and whenever we're together, it is often in a place where we both have to go meet, you know, like when we are often both in Washington State, which is where we're both from, when we're together. And then when we leave, we're both anticipating going back away from family. And so it's been a cool contrast, just the military and her as a missionary, for me to view it as missionary work, too. When we leave, and like I, she faces that same heartache, heartache when she goes, but she specifically knows she's called to go and serve the Lord, you know, in another country. And so it's, I try to think of it in that same frame of mind, like you're kind of saying, like the Lord is going to be faithful and be alongside us in that journey. This week, I've also been in the Gospels, which has been really cool to read the Gospels chronologically because you will read the same story multiple times, which kind of solidifies the message that it's getting at. Uh, some of the things that stuck out to me this week were, uh, first, just in tying in with how my week has been and what I've been learning in terms of just a steady spirit. 
I was reading in Luke 8 um, and 22, and it talks about Jesus calming the storm. And I just, you know, I was thinking about it, like there's a storm going on and, and Jesus falls asleep. And I think that Jesus lives just like throughout his life, relaxed. Like that's one characteristic of Jesus' life. And it's not because he doesn't care or he has like a whatever happens, happens mindset. Like that's not why he lives relaxed, but the relaxation comes as a byproduct of the connection that he has with God and knowing that he could trust in his power, his strength and his sovereignty. Um, and so like when Jesus falls asleep in a storm, it's not because he doesn't care about his disciples or he isn't worried about, you know, what's going on. Like he, he definitely has a hand in that and he is you know, wants to be there with them and walk through the storm with them. But he, he isn't worried because he knows that he can calm the storm. And so that just to me kind of fit in well with like having a calm spirit. Like we we have the power to live relaxed because we trust in, you know, God's story. He already has it written out. And so even if things come last minute and it's a time crunch and all that, like a way we can be different in this world is by living with our shoulders relaxed, taking a breath and not letting uh, circumstances totally sway our the state of our spirit. Other things that I was reading this week, Matthew 9, 12 says, those who are weak have no need of a physician, but those who are sick go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice for I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. So one, this kind of ties into what, you know, you're learning like, you know, Jesus didn't come for the people who are completely healthy and perfect runners all the time. You know, like he came to meet you in, in your need. But one thing I, I really got to thinking about with this passage is I think one of the things that was a huge struggle for me before coming a, becoming a Christian and one of the biggest like holdups that I had was not understanding why I needed help. Like, what if I am healthy? What if I, I don't? need anything right now because to be honest like up until going to the academy like life had been pretty smooth sailing like I had a really good childhood really good family you know I had great grades and I was involved in every activity and sport and all this stuff like life life seemed pretty great and I didn't necessarily know how this passage would relate to me like hey god what if I am the one who is healthy and what if I don't need What if I don't think I'm a sinner? Because compared to this world, I feel like I'm doing pretty good, you know? And so I struggled with that for a really long time and just didn't feel like I needed any help. So, you know, why would I call out for the Lord for mercy if I didn't need it? You know, so I wrestled with that. And I think, one, I finally did come to a point where, okay, God, like things that I thought were pretty solid in life, they got a little rocky. And so I circumstances led me to needing needing something more but also when people started explaining to me that when we compare ourselves we shouldn't compare ourselves to the world we need to compare ourselves to God's righteousness that's when like the light bulb like oh my goodness I'm awful moment set in which was which was freeing in such a sense that I didn't anticipate when we think about a sheep standing on grass like that sheep is going to look really white and pure and clean but you take that same sheep and put it on snow and that sheep is going to look dirty more brown than like pure white and so we have to do the same thing like we can't compare ourselves to the world standard we have to compare ourselves to the god of the universe like when we look at all that he is which requires being in the word and seeing how jesus lived then then yes we realize our shortcomings and realize that we our sinners and thank goodness then that this Matthew 9 verse is true that he didn't come for the righteous but the sinners yeah because I think people can go their whole lives thinking that they're doing pretty good until until a point you know and that point for some people might not be until like the moment before they die um like they could live their entire life not realizing a need for anything more until like they're face to face with what's next after death. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a reminder for us as Christians, but also in the sense of like when we're speaking to other people, like if they haven't heard the contrast that we can't compare ourselves to the world, like that's kind of the message that I needed to hear when I was first becoming a Christian. And so, I don't know, I was just reminded by that through this verse this week. And also when thinking about the election, because the election is right around the corner, 
the thing, the thing with the world standards, and even just like thinking about all the issues in the election, for example, like abortion and the like border crisis and economics. Like when you think of every key issue in an election, the standard of good, like of what is considered good with every issue that the world has is not consistent. Like the right and the left, they have a completely different view of what good is on those issues. And so if you try to compare yourself to the world, like it's just going to be confusing because it's not a clear, like black and white. Like there's no definition of what's good in this world. The only definition of what's good comes from the word. And that's why we need to be in the word and, you know, seeing where we stand in relation to the God of the universe, not in regard to like people in the world. And then I also, another verse that came to mind when I was thinking about this, and it's a verse that our pastor was going over last week in church, was Revelation 2, 4 through 5. And it says, he, the author here is talking to the church in Ephesus. And first he commends them saying like, okay, you've done, you've, you've done good, all this stuff. But then he says, but I have this against you, that you have abandoned the love you had at first. Remember, therefore, from where you have fallen, repent and do the things you did at first. So even for people who are walking in the faith, like we have to remember the height from which we have fallen. We have to remember where God stands above us. And when you realize that compared to God, you realize how incredible the gospel really is. So it makes me less confident in my flesh and more confident in the God of the universe. Like, it's funny that as I've like over time since becoming a Christian, I think I used to speak really confidently about some of the things I was learning because, you know, it was all brand new and I still had confidence in me. But over time, it's like my, my confidence in myself actually decreases. Like I'm less prone to just like pretend like I know exactly what's going on in someone's life and all this stuff. Uh, Cause it, I feel like I have like a less of me, more of you mindset. And I want to have that even more. <laughs> like I know that I'm still, I mean, the whole, the whole point here is I'm still so far gone, you know, like I want, I want the Lord. <laughs> so that's what I've been learning this week. And I, if anyone else has felt that way where they like, don't understand why they like, why they need help. Like, don't be afraid to admit that because I, I was there and I think more people feel that way than we'd like to admit. Like nobody wants to say like, oh yeah, I got it all figured out. Like, why do I need this? But I think a lot of people actually do feel that way. So just know that you should be comparing yourself to God and not the world. I love what you said because I feel like that was also something I struggled with. I struggled thinking that I was fine. And then it's true when you look to Jesus, you see how not fine you are and how far you are from from him and that was like a pivotal moment in my faith as well and so I love that you brought it up because it's hard to be vulnerable about that kind of stuff but I really appreciate your vulnerability in it because I think so many people also struggle with the same thing because I know I did and once you realize how far you're from God and that you need Jesus's righteousness then it changes everything and it changes everything about your faith and everything about God so I really like that you said that. And then I wanted to close with this other thing I feel like God showed me this week. And I had sent Aaron a post from Angela from Girls Gone Bible. And it was so good. So I took a few parts from it. And then the next day, I read the same passage that she talked about in her caption in the Word. And I was like, whoa, this is good. So I'm going to talk about it. But I'm going to read a little bit from her caption. Um, you should go check out the full caption on her Instagram. But it says, I imagine there is a temptation for anyone who receives a platform and microphone and influence to begin to look at themselves fondly and think that God needs them. One of my favorite scriptures is Luke 1940. He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. Jesus doesn't need to use us. He chooses to use us because he's a perfect, loving and relational God who created us with the intention of being in constant communion with us. So I read Luke 19, and it's actually the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, which fulfills the prophecy in Zechariah 9.9, which the prophecy says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. Righteous and having salvation is he, humbled and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So during his triumphal entry, the disciples are saying, Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And a lot of these disciples started following Jesus after he raised Lazarus from the dead, which is what we talked about last week. So super cool seeing it all connect. But the Pharisees in the crowd said, teacher, rebuke your disciples. And this is when Jesus answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. And I was researching this and in the Bible recap, Tara Lee Cobble was talking more in depth into what he means by stones and basically much of the hillside of the mountain, Mount of Olives, which is 
where he entered coming on the road are covered with thousands of tombs that are still there today. And I looked it up on Wikipedia as well, so very reliable source, but it said <laughs> that the western slopes of the mount, those facing Jerusalem, have been used as a Jewish cemetery for over 3,000 years and holds approximately 150,000 graves, making it central in the tradition of Jewish cemeteries. So while it's possible that Jesus is referring to actual rocks here, it's more likely that he's referring to the thousands of gravestones that they're passing on the hillside. So he's basically saying, if you try to stop the living from praising me, the eternal souls of the dead will do it instead. My praise will echo through the universe regardless. And mm -hmm. just like the, my praise will echo through the universe regardless. It yeah. just goes back to like, God doesn't need Aaron and I on this podcast. Like we're not influencers. We do not, not a ton <laughs> of people listen to this right now. Like by no means am I saying that, but I'm sure there are much wiser women in planting groups that could do a great job in this podcast who have more life experience and have known the Lord for longer, but God and his grace is using us to talk about what we're learning. And honestly, this probably blesses me more than it's blessing anyone listening, but just the grace of God to have a friendship with Aaron and him to reveal things to me in scripture to share. Like, I'm just so thankful that he has given us this opportunity. And I was listening to another podcast this week where it talked about how we're to chase the cross and not the crown. And so in doing this podcast, I just want us to be chasing the cross and then bring people along as we pursue Jesus. It's not, we're not chasing followers or anything like that or any, any recognition, but just making this podcast about Jesus and not us. Cause even if like nobody listens, it's the sacrifice of all the work that goes into this is so worth it for my relationship with Christ and Aaron's relationship with Christ and our relationships with each other. So I just really loved this post. And then reading it the next day just really solidified the yeah. concept that his praise will echo through the universe regardless. And I'm just so thankful mm -hmm. that the Lord has met us where we are. He's, he's shown us our pride and our separation from the Lord. And I'm just thankful. I'm just so thankful because the Lord is great. And and even, even when things are hard, we have him, and that is all that matters. Yeah, so with that, I mean, subscribe or not, because either way, God's, God's glory is going to, to shine, and if it's not us, it'll be, you know, some other way, because he is the light of the world. So we are just so thankful that you tuned in today. If this podcast did impact you at all, go ahead and like it and subscribe, follow along, download it, you know, all the things. Follow us on Instagram at Planning Roots 1 and we'll see you guys next week.